history for the whole world. I have the great pleasure to introduce to you <laughs> Dr. Sven Werner, <laughs> Professor Emeritus from Halmstad University. <laughs> Professor Banner is the Swedish girl on district heating and a hobby gardener that is growing fruits and vegetables on his spare time and shares with his four grandchildren. Welcome on stage, Sven. We're going to move away from you now. Mm, thank you. The stage is yours. Uh, nice to see you all. I got the assignment to explain why we need low temperatures in heat distribution networks. I will try to do it in 20 seconds. No, sorry, 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, but I can't give you all details because ev everything cannot be said in 20 minutes. So I the, 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 the main features I will tell you during this um, 20 minutes. Uh, I have a background as a researcher. I've been researching uh, district heating for about 40 years. Mostly in the year, last years we have been working with European projects. I'm not part of these projects, I've worked in other projects. Uh, the most important for us has been a project called Heatromap Europe, where we found out that the benefit, the annual benefit of district heating in 2050 for whole Europe can be expected to be one bil 100 billion euros a year. It's almost 1% of the European GDP. So it's a... Uh, um, large economic benefit with this heating, if we achieve to do it. Because we, then we have to have a, a market share of this heating that is four times higher than we have today. So it's uh, something, something for you to do. I also written a textbook about this heating, you might have seen it. And I also retired, but I'm still curious about this heating and cooling. So today, in this, f this um, 20 minutes, I will have uh, eight issues. I will uh, give you the five basic statements about uh, the current situation for and future for heat grids. I will talk about heat sources by temperature level. I will bring the economy for lower temperatures. I will define the four generations of district heating. And I give you some examples of current and future temperature levels and uh, explain also why the temperatures are very high today. And then we um, short uh, short uh, explanation how to achieve lower temperatures and then some conclusions so the fa five basic statements it's that we have district heatings today but we have a technology that was designed originally for fossil fuels and the future doesn't contain fossil fuels so then we have to change in some way so we have the temperature levels we have in current networks are based on that technology that was developed for fossil fuels. It is very easy to substitute fossil fuels if you use a high temperature sources as biomass or waste in your supply mix. But if you want to, to use low temperature sources, it becomes more difficult and more expensive. So we have to redesign really our systems in long term. Long term, I mean 2050. I don't, you don't have to do it next year, but I expect you to do it in t uh, until 2050 in order to implement uh, low temperature heat sources. Um, so then we have to see, see what kind of heat sources we have, what, which one is high temperature and which ones are low temperatures. So all combustion fuels, that's high temperature. It's very easy to create high temperatures, because when you burn a fuel, you get the temperatures something between 1,000 and 1,800 uh, degrees. So it's easy to, to supply heat to a building that requires maybe 30, 40 degrees. Um, you have electric boilers that can also generate high temperatures. And we have some elec industrial excess heat at high temperatures. But most sources we have in the future, they will have lower temperatures. Heat pumps becomes more efficient if you have a low temperature in the network. The COP becomes higher. Less electricity is used. Uh, solar collectors, you can have uh, a smaller collective field for the same amount of heat if you have lower temperatures. Geothermal heat, most of your thermal heat resources in Europe have a temperature between 60 and 80 degrees. If the return temperature in the system is 
60 degrees, it's very difficult to, to get it directly into the system. You need a heat pump and it's costly. We have lots of industrial excess heat in, in Europe with low temperatures. Um, many areas in Europe also have water stress problems. They don't have enough water to cool their industries. So if we can connect it to this heating system, then we can cool it by that. Then we have lots of heat recovery from cooling devices, as possible, and we have also heat recovery from concentrated electric use as data centers. So we have lots of sources, but they all heat low temperature. So economy is that you can provide heat at a lower cost if the temperature in the system are lower. Um, and that, that reduced heat supply cost can pay the additional cost you have to get the lower temperatures. So this is the evidence that we published last year from a Danish project called 4DH. We made an estimation for whole Denmark in 2050 with high temperatures and low temperatures. And this is the difference. So you can have it lowered supply co co uh, costs with about 300 million euros a year. Um, you have to have do some additional costs in the system. And then the net benefit becomes something between 200 and 300 million euros. And that's about, you say, the average day is 9 euro per megawatt hour. And 265, it's uh, about 15% of the total cost of this heating today in Europe. So it's a considerable cost reduction we can achieve. And if you have cost reduction for new sources, it's more simple, it's more, more convenient to, to um, introduce them. So this is the one of the very few evidence we have today that, that um, low temperatures are beneficial. Um, in order to label this movement towards this uh, lower temperatures, we have called it fourth generation. In order to, to show that we have made these transitions before, the first generation of our all steam systems were invented in USA in, in the 1880s, in the 70s, 1880s. And they um, was the best available technology for 40 years. Then when district heating was introduced in Germany in the early 1920s, the German engineers said, no, we should not use steam, we should water lower temperatures, then it becomes more efficient. Um, and that was the best technology for 40, 50 years. And then the, in the 1970s, when the Nordic countries went for district heating in order to, to um, reduce the demand for fuel oil for heating, they said, we can do it at lower temperatures not as high that was used before. So they invented uh, the third generation. And they also introduced, uh, they, they started to use prefabricated pipes and also compact heat exchangers in um, substations. And now we have the fourth new movement, with the climate change issue um, uh, gives us an opportunity to make a new change that we call fourth generations. Uh, so every generation is, is uh, something that is associated with time. Because time is, I have uh, parents and I have children and grandchildren, and we are all four generations together. Um, and the typical supply temperatures we have used is very high temperatures where you have steam. You have some at lower if you have high, su temperature, high supply temperatures. They are still exist, these systems in Europe. Geneva system, for instance, uh, is a second generation system. And then we have the medium supply temperatures between 60 and 100 degrees. And the low temperature we're talking about is something between 10 and 70. We also include cold distributing systems that you have uh, distributed uh, uh, a medium temperature, in the, uh, um, a low temperature in, in the networks, and then you have local heat pumps in the customer, at the customers. So we're talking about what kind of, of characteristics we should have for a fourth generation system is that you should be able to, to deliver low temperature heat for heat demands for space heating and hot water. And in current buildings, the, the temperature demands can be rather high because 
also the, the, the buildings were designed according to the rules in the fossil fuel era. So they had to be lower in the future. We should be able to distribute heat with low grid losses. Today the loss is about 10%. If you don't do anything and just continue to, to accept lower heat demands, this proportion of heat loss will increase with high temperatures. Uh, and it's very easy to cut the heat loss with to one quarter. It's just to cut the temperature level to half and increase the uh, heat resistance in the pipes with dou to double it. So it's, it's, it's done today. And we should use renewable and recycled heat from low temperature sources. But we also have to communicate more with the electrical system and also the gas system. Because if you cooperate, you can benefit both of them. Especially when you have more variable variable and um, power sources as wind and solar. We already cooperate with, with the electric system by CHP plants, but we also can, can um, uh, buy electricity to generate low cost heat. But we also need suitable planning cost and motivation structures. And there we have the politicians. They have to change the rules for the game. Uh, we have lots of examples in Europe where old rules made in the uh, fossil fuel era um, a barrier becomes a barrier for this heating. There's a small local estate tax in in UK designed for natural gas pipes. When you apply them for this heating pipes, which are much wider, it's a catastrophe for the projects. They take all the benefits to the tax uh, incomes. Now we, t we talk about different temperature levels. These are uh, Examples I have collected from different countries. The first three bars is from Sweden. First bar is the typical average supply temperatures and return temperatures in Sweden during one year. And the second and third bar is the highest temperature level in Sweden and the lowest. So you see this variation b b among systems. The three next bars from Denmark, they have somewhat lower temperatures than in Sweden because they have lots of substations with heat without heat exchangers so the distant heating water is circulate circulated in the in each ra radiator system and you also have a variation in Denmark then I have three examples from, from the form in Eastern Europe from Latvia from Poland and, and, and the second from Poland they have a temperature similar to the Nordic ones and then I have two examples from Geneva one from Brescia in Italy they have high temperature systems so it's a very large variation of temperature levels this information is never collected in Europe, so nobody knows exactly the situation for temperature levels in, in Europe. This is just I asked my friends to, to, to send me information, I got it. Um, so then we can uh, see the different possibilities here. The first bar here is the average in Sweden. The second is Denmark, somewhat lower, but the current technology we call third generation, they have the ability to generate, to, to uh, use lower temperatures than we actually use in Sweden. So why do we have a difference between real systems and theoretical systems? That's because we have lots of malfunctions in our systems. We have not bothered about them before because they were not so expensive. But actually, in the future, these, these um, uh, malfunctions become about five times more expensive if you have low temperature sources. So you really have a driving force in the future to eliminate all malfunctions in the existing systems. And we'll talk about that later in the second presentation later today. Then we had a uh, vision for warm district heating systems for about 50 degrees in the supply and 20 in degree, uh, degrees in, this, in the return. Um, a, as a vision, and we started the 4DH project in Denmark six, seven years ago. Then I put the fifth and the sixth bar there as an example of very oil systems that will really want to distribute heat with low temperatures, but they don't succeed according to the vision because they still inherit all the malfunctions from the old technology. So they cannot reach a very low temperature. In current systems, they can, you, the lowest temperature you can have in the annual average is about 30 degrees. Then you don't have any, any uh, errors at all. But most systems in Europe have uh, return temperatures between 40 and 60 degrees. So they have lots of errors in the system. Then we make a change here, because this is just temperature levels. But if I want to calculate something, that I have the driving force for, for instance, heat losses. And I go transfer this to what I call t 
degree time number, uh, degree time numbers. And it's just you take the average of this one to, um, and, and look at the temperature difference to the environment times the, uh, the uh, hours in the year. Then you get these numbers. So this is the driving force for heat losses. To, 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 to have the characteristics for, for heat temperature levels. So you see that the current level in Sweden is 500,000 degree hours, while the vision is uh, about 220,000. So you, you can cut uh, actually heat losses by half if just to reduce the temperature level half. And you see also the other ones. Um, so this is something that you can calculate with. And here I made an estimation of what is needed in Sweden from coming from 500,000 to 220,000 degree hours. And it's in three steps. The first is eliminate all network bypasses and all temperature errors. That's the largest part. We have already errors that increase the temperatures. If we learn how to avoid these all errors in the future, then we have almost half of the change. The second is that we should have longer uh, heat exchanges in substations. Today we have a thermal length of about four, but I like to have it six to eight in the future. Then you can allow lower supply temperatures in the networks. And the third is that you also have to have lower uh, temperature demands in buildings. And some of this change we got for free because if we, when uh, proper owners reduce the heat demands, they also reduce the temperature demands. Uh, today it's still uh, common in Sweden that you use 60 degrees at the design supply temperature radiators. It's a crime. It's a crime because we, need, we should just use 45 in the fu in future. Then we can deliver 50 degrees all to, to, to these buildings in the future. So this is a very simple explanation of what to do in the next decades for, for reducing the temperatures in, in these thickening systems. Uh, and this is an example of typical errors in substations we made 20 years ago when we learned this. And this two dimension, it's if, if it's located in heat exchangers, in control chains or in system design. And where it is, so if it's a design error, malfunction error or a set point error. But you see most of the errors appear in this control chain. Um, I can say, you can, can uh, express it very polite saying that it's a improvement potential in contained chains. So that we have a, a, a transformation roadmap. We should eliminate temperature errors. We should avoid all these errors in the future. We should use heat exchanges for longer thermal lengths. We should reduce the temperature levels in temperature demands in buildings, and we could connect new areas in. Um, in, in the existing areas by, by, for instance, connect them to the return temperature and have that uh, concurrent operation and have a, a vision of supply temperature of 50 degrees and return temperature of 20 degrees. That's a vision. Nobody has shown that in reality yet, but hopefully that can be do soon. Uh, the conclusion is then that if we have non-combustible heat sources in the future, we need lower temperature levels because it's you make money from that. And the, t the temperature levels is, is set in the in the substations. It's a the, it's the customer buildings and the substation together that set the temperature level in the system and the errors. And we need new guidelines for substations in order to get these lower temperatures for all Europe. It's great if all Europe uses the sta same standards, then we have much longer um, series of, of products that can be manufactured and you get lower prices from that. And here is some input links that uh, uh, papers and so I have written, I participated in and written during this issue the last years. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> Thank you very much for mm. an interesting presentation. Okay, there? thank you. Okay. Mm. Yeah, we could uh, listen to you all day, but uh, 